Hello everyone. This video is mainly for my friends, but for those who chance upon it and don't know me, my name is Eric Wilson. I live in Canada, in Hamilton, which is near Toronto. Now the reason for the video is to address an issue that's very important in the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. As a people, we are failing to obey a command of Jehovah God. That command is found at Psalm 146.3. It says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, who cannot bring salvation. What am I talking about? Well, to explain that, I need to give you a little background on myself. I was uh, baptized in 1963 at the age of 14. In 1968, I went to Columbia with my family. My dad took early retirement took my sister out of high school without graduating, and off we went to Columbia. Why did he do that? And why did I go along? Well, I went along mainly because I was 19. It was a great adventure. But there I learned to really uh, value the truth, to really start to study the Bible. I pioneered, I became an elder. But the reason we went was because we believed the end was coming in 1975. Now, why did we believe that? Well, if you go by what you heard at the district, con or should say regional convention last year, on Friday afternoon, at the video, there was a video, uh, you would assume that it was because the brothers around the world got a little carried away. It was our fault for getting carried away. That's not true, and it's not really nice to even suggest such a thing, but that's what was put forward. I was there, I lived it. What actually happened was this, in 1967, at the book study, we studied a new book, uh, Life Everlasting and the Freedom of Sons of God. And in this book, we studied the following. This is from page 29, paragraph 41. According to this trustworthy Bible chronology, 6,000 years from man's creation will end in 1975, and the seventh period of a thousand years of human history will begin in the fall of 1975. So now if we move on to the next page, page 30, paragraph 43, we, it draws the conclusion that set us all off. How appropriate it would be for Jehovah God to make of this coming seventh period of a thousand years a Sabbath period of rest and relief. Release, sorry a great jubilee Sabbath for the proclaiming of liberty throughout the earth to all its inhabitants. This would be most timely for mankind. It would also be most fitting on God's part. For, remember, mankind has yet ahead of it what the last book of the Holy Bible speaks of as the reign of Jesus Christ over earth for a thousand years, the millennial reign of Christ. And then skipping ahead, it would not be by mere chance or accident but would be according to the loving purpose of Jehovah God for the reign of Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath, to run parallel with the seventh millennium of man's existence. Now, you're an obedient Jehovah's Witness at this time. You're believing that the faithful and discreet slave is telling you something. The faithful and discreet slave, by the way, at that time, were all the anointed on earth. And we used to believe that they would write in their findings as Jehovah gave them truth uh, through the Holy Spirit, and that those letters would then be gathered together and the uh, society would see the direction the Spirit's leading and publish articles or books. So we felt this was Jehovah speaking through the faithful and discreet slave, telling us that the end was going to come in 1975. It made perfect sense. And we believed it. And of course, the society continued to promote 1975. If you don't believe me, Pull out your Watchtower library, you know, the, the uh, CD-ROM program, type in 1975, and starting in 1966, move forward through all the Watchtowers and other publications that you find with that, with that search, and see how often 1975 comes up and is promoted as uh, the date in which the millennium will begin. It was also promoted at district conventions and circuit assemblies, at all of them. So anybody who says different didn't live through that period. Now, Mark Sanderson, well, he was in diapers and 
when I was in Colombia, and, and uh, uh, Anthony Morris III was uh, still serving in the army in Vietnam. But I lived it. I know it. And anyone who is my age has lived it too and knows it. Now, am I complaining about that? No. Why? Why am I still serving all these years afterwards? Why do I still believe in Jehovah God and Jesus Christ? Because my faith was always in God and not in men. So when this went south, I thought, oh, okay, we, we were stupid. We did something silly, but that's what men do. I made many mistakes in my life, many silly mistakes. And I know that the men at all levels of the organization are no better or no worse than I am. We're just humans. We have our imperfections. It didn't bother me because I knew it was the result of human imperfection. It wasn't Jehovah. And that's fine. So what's the problem? Something has changed. In 2013, I was removed. I mentioned, I don't know if I've mentioned that yet, but I was removed as an elder. Now that's okay, because I was having uh, doubts about a number of things, and I was very conflicted, so I was quite happy that I was removed. It kind of gave me an escape from that responsibility and that there was a certain amount of cognitive dis dissonance that I was undergoing. So it helped resolve that. That's fine. But it was the reason I was removed that's troubling. The reason was that I was asked a question. Now, this question never came up before, but is coming up all the time now. The question was, will you obey the governing body? My answer was, yes. I always have as an elder, and the brothers around the table can attest to that, and I always will. But then I added, but I will obey God as ruler rather than men. I added that because I knew which direction it was going. And my past tells me that these men make mistakes. So there's no way I can give them absolute, unconditional, unquestioning obedience. I have to look at everything they tell me to do and evaluate it in the light of the scriptures. And if they are not conflicting with the scriptures, I can obey. But if they do conflict, I cannot obey. I have to obey God as ruler rather than men. Acts 5.29. It's right there in the Bible. Okay, so why is that a problem? The circuit overseer said to me, it's evident that you are not fully committed to the governing body. So unconditional obedience or unquestioning obedience is now a requirement for elders. And as such, I couldn't in good conscience continue to serve. So I didn't appeal the case. Is that an isolated case? Was that one circuit overseer getting a little carried away? I wish it were the case, but that's not the case. Allow me to illustrate. There have been many cases, many incidents in my life since then that I could point to, but I'll just pick one as indicative of all the rest. A friend of 50 years with whom we talked about everything and anything. If we had doubts or questions and Bible issues, we could freely talk because we knew that it didn't mean that we had lost our faith in God. I wanted to talk to him about the overlapping generations because to me it seemed like a doctrine that had no scriptural basis. But before he'd even talk about it, he wanted me to affirm my belief in the governing body. And he sent me an email. He said, just as just part of it, in short, we believe this to be Jehovah's organization. We are trying our very best to stay close to it and the direction it is giving us. We feel this is a matter of life and death. I can well imagine that a moment will come when we will be staking our very lives upon the following of direction that Jehovah gives through the organization, we will be willing to do that. Now he's probably thinking about the uh, article that came out right after they declared themselves the faithful and discreet slave in 2013. They, an article came out in November of that year called Seven Shepherds, Eight Dukes, What They Mean for Us Today. And it said, at that time, the life-saving direction that we receive from Jehovah's organization may not appear practical from a human standpoint. All of us must be ready to obey any instructions we may receive, whether these appear sound from a strategic or human standpoint or not. We have to make a life and death decision based on what the governing body tells us. The same governing body that told me about 1975. 
the same governing body that this year, this past year in February, wrote in the uh, February, page 26, paragraph 12, Watchtower, the governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. Therefore, it can err in doctrinal matters or in organizational direction. So here's the question. I have to make a life and death decision based on something that I believe is coming from God, from people who tell me they don't speak for God. They can make mistakes because if you are speaking for God, you cannot make a mistake. When Moses spoke, he, he spoke in God's name. He said, Jehovah has said, you must do this, you must do that. He took them to the Red Sea, which was strategically unsound. But they followed because he had just uh, performed 10 plagues. Obviously, Jehovah was working through him. So when he took them to the Red Sea, they knew that it would come true. Or maybe they didn't. They were actually quite a faithless people. But nevertheless, he performed. He struck the sea with the staff. It divided and they walked through. He spoke under inspiration. If the governing body is claiming that they will be telling us something that will be life or death for us, then they are claiming they're speaking under inspiration. There's no other way. Otherwise, they're just saying, this is our best guess, but it's a life or death situation. That doesn't make sense. And yet, all of us are buying into this. We're believing in the governing body as virtually infallible, and anyone who questions anything is called an apostate. If you doubt something, you're an apostate. And, and you get thrown out of the religion. You get, you get shunned by everyone. Even though your, your goal is truth. So, let's put it this way. You're a Catholic. And, and you go to, to a Jehovah's Witness and you say, Oh, we're the same. Our Pope will tell us what to do when, when Jesus comes. What would you say as a Jehovah's Witness to that Catholic? Well, you'd want to say no. No, because, uh, you're not God's organization. Well, why am I not Jehovah's or, or God's organization? The Catholic would say, because you're a false religion, right? We're a true religion, but you're a false religion. And so he wouldn't work through you, but he will work through us because we teach the truth. Okay, well, that's a valid point. If we are the true religion, which I've always believed, then Jehovah will work through us. Why don't we ch put that to the test? Or are we afraid to do so? In 1968, when I was in, in, in Columbia, we had the truth that leads to eternal life. Chapter 14 was how to identify the true religion. And in it, there were five points. Uh, the first point was, believers would love one another as Christ loved us. So love, but not just any kind of love. The love of the Christ would permeate the congregation. And it would be visible to people outside. Uh, the true religion would adhere to God's word, the Bible. It wouldn't deviate. It wouldn't teach falsehoods. Hellfire, for example, wouldn't teach falsehoods. It would sanctify God's name. Now, that's more than simply using it. Anybody can say Jehovah. Sanctifying his name goes beyond that. Proclaiming the good news is another facet. It would have to be a preacher of the good news. And finally, it would maintain political neutrality. It would be separate from the world. These are so important that the truth book said on uh, at the end of that chapter, the question at issue is not whether a certain religious group appears to meet one or two of these requirements, nor whether some of its doctrines conform to the Bible. Far more than that, the true religion must measure up in all these respects, and its teachings must be in harmony, in full harmony with God's word. So it's not good enough to have two of them or three of them or four of them. You have to meet all of them. That's what it said. And I agree. And every book we've published since the truth book that replaced it as our main teaching aid has had the same chapter with the same five points. I think they've added the six now. But let's just stick with the original five for now. So I'm proposing in a series of videos to publish research to see if we meet each and every one of these qualifications. But remember, even if we fail to meet one of them, we fail as a true religion. And therefore, the claim that Jehovah is speaking through the governing body falls flat because it depends on us being Jehovah's organization. Now, 
if you're still watching, I'm, I'm kind of amazed because we're, we're so conditioned to not listen that m most people will, will have probably shut this down long ago. But if you're still listening, that means you love truth. And I welcome that. But I know there's a lot of things you're facing. Uh, a lot of obstacles. Call them elephants in the room. They'll get in the way of our research. I know this because I've been researching for the last eight years now. I've been through it. I've been through all these emotions. For example, we're Jehovah's true organization, so where else would we go? Jehovah has always had an organization, so if we're not the true one, what is? There isn't any other one that seems to qualify. Um, what about apostasy? Aren't we acting like apostates by rejecting, by not being loyal to the organization, rejecting its teachings? Shouldn't we just wait for Jehovah to fix things? He'll fix things in his own time. These are all questions and thoughts that come up, and they're valid, and we need to deal with them. So we'll deal with them first in subsequent videos, and then we'll get down to our research. How does that sound? My name is Eric Wilson. I'm going to put up some links at the end of this video so that you can get to the next videos. Uh, there's several already done, and we'll go from there. Thank you for watching.